Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our second webinar on grid integration issues. Uh, we're really excited to have a, a panel of three experts that have been looking at a lot of the evolving and upcoming issues that are that are being addressed by the California energy markets right now. And uh, we're just really excited to have such a nice group with you, with us today. So if you guys have questions, we want to try to make this an interactive series. So please use the question feature on your GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar so that you can submit them to us. And I'll do our very best to either interrupt the team while they're talking and make them feel awkward, or just ask them one of your really good questions. Um, don't be worried, though. Sometimes people have a little overlap, and I might mush them together some. So, uh, so please keep your questions coming. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Greg Brinkman. Great. Thanks a lot, Aaron. So today I'm going to be talking about the uh, California 2030 Low Carbon Grid Study. Um, it's a study that uh, was sponsored by a wide and uh, diverse group of funders uh, in, in California and beyond. Um, a number of uh, the funders came from uh, industry and uh, groups and um, foundation money. And uh, this is a list here of the, the sponsors and the people who were on the steering committee. And then we also had a technical review committee, and this is a, an independent committee that um, was not part of the funders of the study that looked at a lot of our assumptions. Uh, we met a number of times throughout the study, uh, and they helped sort of uh, validate some of our methodologies and our interpretations and things like that. I would like to say that um, the final report and the conclusions are from the study team and, and may not represent the, the specific interpretations of any of these uh, organizations on this list. So some of the study objectives for this study, uh, what we set out to sort of answer some questions about um, what the feasibility would be of achieving a highly decarbonized electric sector in the year 2030. And so we're looking at 50% um, carbon emissions reductions below 2012 levels in California's electric sector. And we want to look at both an economic assessment and what we're going to focus on today which is the analysis of integration issues that, that can happen from high penetrations of renewables that we'll need to achieve these, these carbon reductions. So we look a lot at some of these integration issues and potential curtailment. Uh, this portion of the study uh, that I'll be presenting on today, uh, also we did a lot of uh, sensitivity analyses and different scenario analyses to understand the key drivers behind these challenges. Um, today we're only going to have time to present some of the um, so the bookend kind of sensitivities, but we did uh, a number of different sensitivities that I will talk about later to understand sort of a, a detailed dive at some of these um, some of these uh, potential drivers of integration issues. So this slide looks at uh, some of the renewable portfolios in each of our uh, different scenarios. We had three different uh, renewable portfolios that we looked at. On the left, you have the, the baseline scenario. This is basically uh, California's uh, LTPP, the long-term procurement planning process, the 2014 33% uh, case. Uh, when we started this study, we were um, in, in the, we were before California had the 50% RPS, and so we wanted to look at this baseline scenario as a sort of counterfactual case, and it's still an interesting counterfactual case, even though um, the legislation is in place for 50-plus uh, percent RPS. And, and so you can see in this chart um, which types of renewable generation make up the, uh, the renewable portfolio. This chart shows only the renewable generation. And I'd also like to note that there's about um, 20 terawatt hours of energy efficiency of difference between the um, baseline and the two target portfolios. We have two target portfolios that, ha that achieve um, approximately 55 to 57 percent renewable penetration, and these are the two uh, cases that, um, that achieve the, the 50 percent carbon reduction. So, so we've got two different portfolios to look at and compare. Uh, the, the main difference between these portfolios is that the target portfolio is more diverse, and the target high solar swaps some of that diversity for more PV, and this is more indicative of the um, procurement trends that exist today in California. And so the difference between the two cases is um, that some of the uh, photovoltaics in the high solar case are swapped for um, out-of-state wind and uh, mostly in-state geothermal in the, and a little bit of biomass in the target portfolio that is more diverse. Um, all of the portfolios have the same uh, assumed rooftop PV um, penetration. 
So one thing that we wanted to study in this, uh, that we wanted to analyze in this study is the impact of some of our grid flexibility assumptions. There are um, institutional and physical um, conditions on the grid that really have a significant impact on some of our uh, integration um, challenges on the system. And so we wanted to kind of look at some bookend cases and, and uh, play with some of the assumptions to understand some of these key drivers. And so um, what some of the bookend cases that I'll be presenting today are looking at what we've called the conventional flexibility and enhanced flexibility cases. And so on the left, you have some uh, this suite of assumptions that makes up the conventional flexibility. And on the right, we have the suite of assumptions that makes the enhanced flexibility. And um, I, I will mention here that the conventional flexibility represents some increase in flexibility beyond uh, what we see today, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, but so the, the four things that make up the conventional flexibility assumption suite is uh, we have a 70% requirement for out-of-state California entitled renewable generation, which also includes uh, nuclear at Palo Verde and, um, and hydro at Hoover, and 70% of that generation must be imported at every hour of the year. And this is similar to some assumptions that California ISO is making, and it represents um, p potentially some uh, of the, it's sort of a proxy for the uh, bucket rules in California. Uh, in the enhanced flexibility case, we only have the physical limitations on imports and exports, no requirement that it is imported. Uh, the second one is um, a 25% minimum generation rule in California balancing authorities that must come from local fossil fueled and hydro sources. This is also a constraint that California ISO was modeling in their LTPP 2014 study process, but they have relaxed this constraint somewhat uh, very recently, or I should say they're planning on relaxing this constraint um, in future studies to be more of a uh, California-wide um, constraint. And this is uh, out of concern for uh, dynamic issues and controllability and things like that. So as we um, get more studies to understand these issues in more detail, uh, I think we, that we'll be able to use a more precise um, assumption and requirement to deal with these types of issues. In the enhanced flexibility case, we do not have any um, local generation requirements. Uh, in the flexibility case, we have just the um, approximately 1.5 gigawatts battery storage to meet the CPUC requirement. In the enhanced flexibility case, in addition to that, we have a gigawatt of new pumped hydro in California and 1.2 gigawatts of new out-of-state compressed air energy storage at the end of the uh, Intermountain Power Project line uh, near Delta, Utah. The fourth difference between the two cases is uh, deals with the ancillary service ability, to, the ability to provide ancillary services from hydro and pumped hydro resources. Um, for the conventional flexibility case, we basically tuned the ability of the, the hydro, the, uh, how much capacity was allowed to bid into these markets so that the results matched um, the approximate CAISO ancillary service provision from the year 2013. And in, uh, I, I should mention that if you allow the model to um, constrain only the physical limits of hydro and pump storage, uh, the model likes to use it to serve uh, a very large percentage of the ancillary service provision, which is why we put these limits on here. In the enhanced flexibility case, we have less strict limits on how much the hydro and pump storage can provide for ancillating, uh, ancillary services. So I should also note here that uh, this, the suite of these four assumptions, the, the sum total of all of them, can be much more significant than the sum of the individual impacts. So as you start combining these, um, these different uh, constraints on flexibility, you start seeing these, uh, these impacts more and more. Now, in the next slide, uh, I wanted to mention the key differences between today and the conventional flexibility assumption. Uh, I just want to go through these relatively quickly. Um, in, the, uh, in the model, we assume that there's an optimal west-wide dispatch. We do have hurdle rates to, uh, to serve as constraints for how much power can flow between regions and how optimally the power flows between regions, but it is um, an, a system-wide optimization. Uh, we assume that Diablo Canyon Nuclear Generating Station retires. It's a zero carbon resource, so it would make hitting a carbon target easier, but it would uh, potentially increase integration challenges. Uh, we also have three million electric vehicles assumed to be on the road. 
uh, which is in line with some of the um, governor's announcements there. And that adds 13 terawatt hours of load and gives the, the possibility of up to 3,000 megawatts of uh, additional load, uh, particularly during times of curtailment. Um, the non-renewable generation fleet changes include some uh, coal retirements outside of California. So in addition to the, um, the announced fleet retirements that we also have uh, in the TEPC 2024 common case, we also have the, um, the IPP power plant, which is assumed to retire in 2025 based on the uh, LADWP IRP. Uh, we also added some transmission uh, in the target portfolio cases. Uh, including a, a north-south line from uh, Idaho to southern Nevada, uh, approximately imitating the SWIP North line, and also um, assumed uh, transmission from New Mexico to get it uh, onto the west of River Pass. And then again, I mentioned this already, the rooftop PV assumes that it's, uh, we assume that it's the same 24 terawatt hours, terawatt hours in all of the scenarios. I don't want to uh, dwell on this too much. Like I said, I'll be presenting mostly the bookend cases today. Uh, but we did model uh, 23 different scenarios, which um, and the different things that were varied within the scenarios were the resource investments, uh, like I mentioned, the diverse target portfolio uh, compared to the high solar portfolio, uh, both with and without additional storage. Uh, we also also looked at operational or institutional changes, which include those import requirements I talked about, the local generation requirements, the ancillary service provision, and also the ability to to adjust and have flexibility in your import schedules. Aaron, do you have a question? Hey, Greg, um, I'm getting some questions from people that are asking about the nuclear retirement assumption in Diablo Canyon. Can you talk a little bit more about that, please, and what the impact is? Yeah, sure. We were really uh, a little bit uncertain about what to do with Diablo Canyon, and so we wanted to do sort of the, the conservative assumption, which is to uh, go ahead and retire it and then have to replace it with additional uh, renewable generation, which will make it uh, more challenging for the system to operate. So. We weren't really sure what to do with it because of some of the, uh, the studies that have come out on how much it might cost for Diablo Canyon to get relicensed. And so, um, so we basically took the, the, the more challenging of the two assumptions and went ahead and retired it. Um, I think probably some of the people on the phone are familiar with, with some of the cost estimates that have come out for relicensing Diablo Canyon. Um, in addition to be, it being on the fault line, it's also got some once through cooling issues, I believe, that could cost billions or tens of billions of dollars to address. So I saw that you mentioned that we have uh, geothermal resources and, and some CFP and some CPB. What about offshore wind? Was that considered at all? We did not include any additional offshore wind in this study. Yep. Uh, I believe most in California will mostly be floating platform, um, which is uh, cost prohibitive for the near term. Potentially in a longer term, as California goes beyond 50%, that could be um, on the table. Thanks for the questions. Keep them coming. Um, the, the, the next uh, sort of thing that we varied for our sensitivities is demand side flexibility. We looked at uh, cases with higher levels and lower levels of demand response. And we also um, modeled some other sort of conditions outside uh, the model that, that have an impact on the ability to reach these, uh, these levels of penetration, which include higher west-wide levels of renewable penetration, lower gas prices, higher CO2 prices, and different hydro resource levels. So we did model a, a wet year and a dry year. So if you want to see all those, um, you'll have to read the report because I'm going to focus on some of the bookend scenarios uh, that, that show uh, you know, what, the, what the impacts could be. So uh, first, I just wanted to mention um, in this slide that uh, California can achieve this 50% reduction in CO2 levels uh, by 2030 under a wide variety of scenarios. Uh, all of our scenarios did meet the 50% carbon reduction target except for the dry hydro assumptions. Uh, so during a dry year with the build-outs that we've made, uh, and with the conventional grid flexibility assumptions, uh, we don't reach the target. You will notice here that there is some uh, difference in emissions between the conventional and the enhanced flexibility cases. This is primarily due to curtailment in the conventional flexibility cases, and so you have to operate more of your fossil fuel resources to make up for that curtailment. And so that's why we see lower emissions in the enhanced flexibility cases compared to conventional. Uh, also, the, the portfolio does make some difference, especially in the conventional case, as in the high solar portfolio, we do see a little bit more curtailment uh, compared to the, um, the more diverse conventional portfolio. So th this slide shows the, the value of the renewable energy and energy efficiency and that it depends on the rest of the system. 
and the institutional framework. In the target portfolio, we see 4.3 to 4.8 billion dollar reduction in um, in production costs, and this is compared to. Um, so uh, I'll give you a teaser for the uh, capital cost assessment, which was done by JBS Energy. This is um, slightly lower than the uh, than the capital cost of these scenarios, but uh, I'll, I'll mention that in a few minutes. And so uh, we also see here that in the baseline case, the enhanced flexibility assumptions are worth about $65 million more per year in operation costs compared to the conventional flexibility assumption. So 65 out of the, the 10 plus billion dollars of operational costs is a pretty small number. And so the, the impact of those flexibility assumptions today and in a low renewable penetration case is relatively modest. However, in the target portfolio, uh, as we get to renewable penetration levels above 50%, we start seeing um, over $500 billion in benefit. And so that flexibility that we don't see a whole lot of benefit for today, we do see a lot of benefit for in, um, in a higher penetration scenario. This slide shows the curtailment, and uh, curtailment, like some of these other uh, outputs I'm talking about, varies significantly uh, between the scenarios. Uh, the left three bars in this chart are the curtailment percentage for the enhanced flexibility cases, and the right three are the conventional flexibility cases. And really, in the conventional flexibility cases, it's the combination of that 25% local generation requirement with the 70% import requirement that drives the curtailment. And so in the high solar PV portfolio, um, we do see in the conventional flexibility case close to 10% curtailment. Uh, but in a lot of the other cases that are more diverse and or have uh, better flexibility available on the system, we see much uh, lower curtailment levels, of, uh, less than a percent in, some, in most cases except the target conventional flexibility case. I don't want to dwell too much on this slide, but this shows uh, the, the steepest ramp of the year in the target um, enhanced portfolio. The green line there, uh, you might recognize that as sort of a, a duck style curve, which Paul's going to talk about a little bit more in a few minutes, uh, as you have that um, the kind of the real steep peak in the, in the afternoon, evening hours as the sun starts setting. That's the net load curve. Now, the other traces are the various supply and demand side resources that are contributing towards that ramp. And the table on the right shows how many megawatts those resources are ramping between 3 and 4 p.m., which was the steepest load ramp in this particular scenario. And these five resources, the physical imports, the storage, the gas fleet dispatch, the demand response, and the hydro, combine to, uh, to provide most of the flexibility available on the system. And in this case, you can see it's mostly the physical imports, the storage, and the gas fleet dispatch, which combine to, um, to provide that ramping level. But that's this particular ramp. If you look at other ramps at different uh, days and different times in the system, you see these five uh, sources of flexibility uh, contributing differently. And sometimes the demand response and hydro do provide significant ramping. And, uh, but in this case, they didn't. Yes, Aaron. Hey, Greg, I've got a couple questions that are coming in that are asking about um, some of the underlying assumptions. Uh, can you remind us, um, what year are you guys comparing the carbon emissions against? Is it 2016, or what, what year is it? It's 2012. Okay. Um, and so we're, we're comparing to 2012, but California carbon emissions were relatively flat over, over some of those years. And so um, depending on which year you look at, it doesn't change the, the overall um, take-home messages of our study much. Okay, and um, about those gas prices, seven dollars seemed a little high. Yeah, so that's uh, the gas prices are, um, I believe, from EIA projections that uh, that WEC has gone through and and um, adjusted slightly for uh, Western conditions. Um, those those gas prices, uh, we've um, kind of gone back and forth a little bit on them, and and it doesn't change the 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 main results of our study, although it would have an impact on the um, the cost effectiveness of the renewables. And, and there are some sensitivities done on the gas price, not in our integration analysis, but in the JBS Energy capital cost analysis, where we compared the, where JBS Energy and Bill Marcus compared the capital costs to the, these production cost benefits. So we've, we've done some sensitivities on that. It's not that interesting for the um, flexibility and the integration questions, but it's potentially interesting for the capital cost side of things. Great. Okay, so the, the um, sort of, quick two-bullet version of the overall conclusion of our study 
is that these, uh, the results that I've shown today indicate that achieving a low carbon grid 50% below 2012 levels is possible by 2030 with relatively limited curtailment if the institutional fle frameworks are flexible. Now, if there are less flexible institutional frameworks, which is the conventional flexibility assumptions we talked about, and a less diverse generation portfolio, which is the high solar portfolio that we talked about, this could cause higher curtailment up to 10%, higher operational costs up to $800 million higher, and higher carbon emissions up to 14% higher. So the conclusion kind of shows that, that if, we, uh, if California goes forward and um, is it able to achieve that diversity and flexibility, the uh, integration impacts are not that dramatic. But if you start looking at less flexible institutional frameworks and less diverse generation portfolio, the impacts are uh, more significant. Uh, these companion studies that I've mentioned a little bit, um, I'm going to give you the one bullet version. And, and in the next slide, there is a, um, a link to the study website and all of these studies so that you can read up on them. Uh, but, but Bill Marcus and JBS Energy found that the annualized capital cost of those incremental renewables, transmission, and storage for the target enhanced portfolio was about $5.1 billion, uh, which is about $230 million more than the production cost reduction. This would be about six-tenths of a percent of the annual revenue requirement in California. And depending on what assumptions we look at, if we look at different gas prices, uh, different um, discount rates, and different economic conditions, uh, Bill Marcus found that this could range from a 3% cost benefit to a 6% cost increase uh, based on the annual revenue requirement. Uh, GE Energy also looked at some of the dynamic issues in the LCGS scenarios. This was a um, qualitative analysis, not the quantitative analysis. So it looked at some previous studies and looked at some of the impacts that we showed uh, from this study in the production cost modeling and found that there could be some risks, although there are mitigation options that uh, exist today that could provide reliability for uh, lower costs and emissions um, com compared to uh, you know, additional curtailment to provide that transient stability. And so you know, what Nick Miller likes to say is that we just need to uh, focus on good engineering practices and do more, uh, certainly more follow-up work on, on these types of questions. So uh, with that, that's the end of my study. Um, this slide, I believe, will uh, eventually be posted. And it does have links to, uh, to these studies and, uh, and the Low Carbon Grid website. Great. Well, well, thanks a lot, Greg. We've gotten a, a lot of good questions from people and uh, kind of interspersed them along the way. This is just a reminder to participants. Um, please explain, you know, send us your questions and we can answer them. And, and what do you know? We get one right away. So, uh, so Greg, here's a question from the lines for you. Um, why is it that geothermal isn't integrated at the same level as solar and wind? In, Talk to a little bit of, about the geothermal assumptions you guys made. Yeah, sure. So um, when we made the diverse portfolio, the original diverse portfolio, we wanted to make a portfolio that was sort of a blend between what we might be seeing today with procurement trends and a system that we felt comfortable would be uh, reasonable in its operation. And then we w to study the impact of those different portfolios, that's why we made the high solar portfolio. So we're not really putting necessarily a stamp of approval on these exact portfolios but we built one to be diverse and one to be less diverse so that we could understand the differences between those. So you shouldn't take this to be that th this portfolio is exactly what NREL is recommending for California in 2030. Okay, I've got one more question that's kind of come up in a couple different ways from users. Um, it's about imports. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you assume for import capability and, and how you guys did some sensitivities around it? Yeah, so for the import capability, um, California has a lot of import capability, clearly, and uh, we did assume some coal retirement throughout the West, and some of the uh, renewables that we put in were uh, out-of-state generation. So we included in the target diverse portfolio, it does include the, um, uh, some about 12 terawatt hours, terawatt hours of wind in Wyoming, and I believe it was 9 or 10 terawatt hours of wind in New Mexico. And uh, as I mentioned before, in the um, conventional assumptions, we required that 70% of that energy must be imported by California at all times. In the enhanced assumptions, we relaxed that and did not require that. And that's where a lot of the, the sort of curtailment started coming in was when we forced all that energy to come in. And so other than that energy and the Palo Verde nuclear and the Hoover Hydro, no energy was forced into California. Um, in the conventional assumptions, because of that 70% rule, there is basically a minimum import level that. California never imports less than um, 2,000 megawatts. 
in the enhanced cases, you actually see some uh, exporting from California. So we, we kind of explored the bookends of that and certainly allowing some flexibility around those imports as opposed to importing at the levels that California is importing today, um, it makes a significant difference. And in the extra slides that I think we're going to post and, and in the report, there's some detailed analysis of the imports. So um, I'll, I'll let uh, Paul talk now, but if you have more questions, please email me or check those reports and uh, the extra slides. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Um, right now what we're going to do is we're going to transition to talking uh, with Paul Benholm, who's got some uh, work that builds on an, a lot of this analysis from the Low Carbon Grid Study to understand everybody's favorite bird in the power sector, the duck. Thanks, Aaron. So uh, again, my name is Paul Denholm, and I've been looking at uh, solar integration uh, issues uh, for a while here at NREL, along with others. Um, and you can see that uh, Greg Brinkman and Jenny Jorgensen, two of the authors of the LCGS study, were also co-authors of this study. Um, we actually used a lot of the LCGS assumptions and, and modeling framework. So, so you've probably all seen this. This is the duck chart, um, and this was published by the CAISO in 2013. And they raised the big issue of the overgeneration risk. So we wanted to kind of do a deep dive on this chart, understanding what the implications of the duck chart mean for overgeneration and uh, how much overgeneration might happen and, and all the, the issues around overgeneration. So um, overgeneration is simply when we've got more energy than we know what to do with. And, and overgeneration can result from a lot of different factors, but a, a big part of it is flexibility on the grid. And a lot of this flexibility is both technical as well as institutional. And that's one of the, the big themes of, of flexibility work in general is understanding the differences between kind of technical flexibility on the grid as, as well as kind of economic and institutional um, uh, flexibility. So, so one of the things about overgeneration is that overgeneration is, is an easy problem to solve from technically. You simply turn off the, the wind or solar generator. So all wind ger generators can be, can be curtailed. Um, all large-scale solar installations can be curtailed simply. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated if you start having to curtail residential rooftop um, PV and at very high penetration um, we may have to consider how we are able to better control uh, rooftop installations but um, certainly controlling uh, large-scale uh, solar is easy. The problem of course with curtailment is you're throwing away free energy. You're throwing away uh, zero cost, zero carbon energy um, and that makes it harder to meet your RPS goals and, and it makes the economics of wind and solar more challenging. So the duck chart's nothing new. We've been looking at, at the duck chart for 10 years here at NREL and, and other, lots of other studies have been done by various institutions. Um, E3 has done some studies. Um, some folks at the Union of Concerned Scientists have done studies. And all of them have kind of identified this issue around the duck shape and what can be done with it. Um, these studies have also discussed mitigation measures. Um, so here's one um, uh, that, that kind of talks about how to teach the, the duck to be a more streamlined shape by changing uh, various factors on the grid. So we wanted to, to do a deep dive again and look at different penetrations of solar and understand the, the, how the duct chart sh shape changes and how much curtailment might result. So what we did is we took the low carbon grid study framework, the modeling database and, and methods, um, but we modified it to make it more of kind of a today's grid situation. Um, and so we did things like we, we unretired Diablo Canyon, we uninstalled some of the geothermal to make it kind of look like today's grid, and then we started putting more solar onto it and just to see what would happen. So here's a bunch of assumptions. These are largely out of the LCGS um, study, um, and you can kind of read, uh, read this in, in either this slide deck or in the, in the uh, study itself. But again, we, we kind of added um, Diablo Canyon back in and uh, made sure that we had the system um, to be kind of more like today's system. So it looks like Aaron's got a question from the... Yeah, so I was wondering, uh, when you're talking about these assumptions, what do you guys assume about the energy imbalance market? Um, so as with the... Um, the LCGS study, we did assume that California um, can kind of play with its neighbors kind of like it does right now um, with, with hurdle rates to add a little bit of friction, but we didn't explicitly model um, the energy imbalance mar market in terms of its ability to kind of true up short-term um, imbalances. Okay, so here's a duck chart for you. This is March 29th, um, and this is an 11% annual solar situation. And you can see what the problem is. You can see that the net load drops down to well below 10,000 megawatts. Um, so this is the kind of situation where you might see some curtailment. And it turns out that, indeed, 
you can't get the net load down to that level because of the minimum generation constraints on thermal, hydro, nuclear, and other types of generators. So instead of ramping down to, say, 7,000 megawatts, the minimum generation level, um, based on the assumptions we made, again, trying to, to model approximately a, a, uh, a grid of, of today or a grid that, that, that might be under kind of business as usual scenarios, we could only ramp the, the thermal and hydro fleet down to around 12,600 megawatts. And that results in curtailment. So on this particular day, about 5% of the potential um, generation from wind and solar was curtailed. Um, now, it's important to note that, that while people talk about storage, there is already a significant amount of, of storage in California. And we were able to effectively use that storage to avoid some of that curtailment. So by changing the normal patterns of pumping and discharge from the existing pumped hydro fleet in California, in this case, pumping during the day, which in today's grid would be kind of unheard of, but now we've got the situation where you've got low cost energy available in the middle of the day, we were able to avoid a couple thousand megawatts of curtailment during the middle of the day. So that's a good thing, but even with the existing storage, we weren't able to avoid all the curtailment. Now during the summer, things look fine because we don't have that low demand um, situation. We've got lots of demand in the middle of the day from air conditioning, so we don't have a whole lot of curtailment or any, any curtailment during the summer. But going back to our duct chart, if we try and force more uh, PV energy on the system, we're just going to get more curtailment. So here's the, the net load shape going from an 11% scenario to a 15% scenario. And you can see that net load going lower and lower. In this case, the net load would theoretically get down to 5,000 megawatts. But again, we just can't get that low. So all we can do is we can add a little bit of solar around the shoulder period, but you can't, you can't violate that, those minimum generation constraints on your hydrothermal so something has to happen there, and as again, you're just going to get more and more curtailment if you, um, if you try and force more solar onto the grid. So the result of this is you just get more and more curtailment, and that makes the economics of solar look worse and worse. So these curves show the average curtailment or curtailment of all of the PV energy, as well as the marginal curtailment or the curtailment of the incremental amount of solar. And you can see that, that by the time you get to, say, 20% solar, um, the, the, a, any additional amount of solar in the grid becomes less and less valuable. In this case, we're only able to use between, say, 60 and 70% of any incremental energy at 20% solar. So that's that, that marginal curtailment between 30 and 40%. So we're basically throwing away 30 to 40% of the incremental amount of solar energy by the time we get to 20% solar. So, and that corresponds to an increased cost or decreased benefit. So, so the impact of curtailment has been expressed in a couple different ways. Um, if you've seen the decreased value, so Andrew Mills at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has expressed this as the decreased value curve. Um, sometimes here at NREL, we, we express it as an increased cost curve um, based on the fact that you're selling less energy, um, so your cost of energy for the energy you do sell goes up. And you can see that if you start starting with, say, six cents per kilowatt hour, which is where we're approaching in, in California, um, uh, you can see that the marginal cost of solar is getting to eight, nine, ten cents per kilowatt hour, and compared to other low carbon resources, solar becomes less and less competitive. So the question becomes, what are we going to do? And so we, we frame this in terms of either fattening the duck or flattening the duck. So, so a lot of people have talked about flattening the duck, which is trying to avoid that deep belly, um, but we also like to talk about fattening the duck, which is how do we accommodate the normal um, shape of, of solar? How do we accommodate that, that large solar production? Um, so fattening the duck is simply letting that belly shape happen and seeing what we can do to accommodate the natural resource uh, of the solar, uh, the solar resource by decreasing the system minimum generation constraints. If we can decrease the, the constraints of thermal and hydro generators, we can accommodate more of that midday solar. Uh, flattening the duck, of course, is by shifting or adding demand in the middle of the day and, and using that demand later through demand response or energy storage. So those are the real two kind of general categories of, of, of accommodating solar by either flattening or fattening. Um, so here's a case where, where new storage will help flatten the duct. So um, in addition to the existing storage, California has the storage mandate um, that will add uh, 1,325 megawatts of storage. And we can see that by adding that storage, we can shift demand from, from the middle of the day to the later of the day. So that adds about a, can reduce the curtailment, instantaneous curtailment, by a little over 1,000 megawatts. The interesting thing is that storage can also help fatten the duct 
by making the system more flexible. So I'm not going to read this, but you can read this either here or in the, in the report, how that adding storage, especially local storage, you can help uh, decrease some of these requirements for um, operational flexibility. So instead of using partially loaded thermal generators for things like providing operating reserves, frequency stability, and voltage stability, some of those things can be provided by storage. As a result of fattening the duct, we can lower that minimum generation constraint. And here we have a situation where we've been able to reduce the minimum generation level from that 12,600 megawatts to about 10,000 megawatts and accommodate an increased amount of solar. So here's the, the reduction in curtailment that occurs by changing some of the constraints, at, uh, enabling local storage and, uh, and local PV to provide some of those services. So we've reduced the instantaneous uh, curtailment on this day from um, 7,000 megawatts to, to under 4,000 megawatts. You had a question? Yeah, so uh, one of the questions I'm getting again is about the, uh, some of the underlying assumptions with respect to hydro and nuclear plants. How flexible are those in your model? So hydro, for nuclear, that's simple. We establish uh, Diablo Canyon as a base load plant where you, you, where you do not change output. Um, for hydro, we um, ha use the hydro um, limits that were in the LCGS model. And obviously, it's, it's tough when you talk about hydro because you've got to do detailed modeling. Um, but we use kind of the standard assumptions that the Kyle ISO has used in their um, LTPP model for how much you can move the, the hydro plants. So what we see when we can add this additional flexibility is a lot more solar on the grid with, with, less, with less curtailment. So instead of having a situation where by the time you get to 20% um, solar, you get, say, 30% marginal curtailment, we've been able to shift these curtailment curves out to the right. So now we can start talking about 20 to 25 percent or potentially even more penetration of solar with relatively low curtailment. And if we talk about a few other flexibility options, such as demand response, um, where we're able to add additional grid flexibility, shift some additional load, we can start talking about PV penetrations of, again, somewhere in the order of 25 to 30 percent. So by accommodating the natural duct shape, and that's really what we think is going to be critically important here, is, is both accommodating the, the natural shape of the duct curve, as well as doing some shifting, um, we can get to levels of PV penetration um, in the next decade that, that, are, that get kind of interesting from a, from a standpoint of a diverse uh, portfolio. So this doesn't include a lot of other different options. Obviously, more electricity storage could help. Um, CSP with thermal storage could also help, as well as greater interchange between regions. We didn't do any um, changes in terms of how we, we let California play with its neighbors, but that's a, a diff, uh, you know, an option as well. So, so there's a lot of other options. This kind of took a first shot at looking at some of these, um, and we need to do more research to understand how we can get even higher PV penetration and accommodate duct shapes. Um, so you can read these conclusions. Um, and. Um, and, and if you have got any additional questions, be happy to answer those before we transition to Josh. So, uh, so Paul, help, help me figure this out. So it looks like you can get to about 25% solar without adding storage. It's beyond the mandate. Is that is that kind of what you're seeing, or? Yeah. So, so looking at about 25% is where we started. 25, maybe even 30% was where we started seeing the um, that 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 kind of increase in curtailment. And, and at that point, we've, we've considered a lot of the flexibility, the kind of inherent flexibility in the grid. So beyond that 25 to 30 percent, we do start to need to be a lot more aggressive and really kind of start looking maybe at additional storage or some of these other technologies. So that's one of the reasons why we've begun to look more aggressively at the kind of the cost benefit of storage, especially because storage right now is expensive. So we really need to understand the potential benefits of storage, which is one of the reasons why um, Josh Eichmann undertook the, the study of the California storage mandate, so we can start understanding these cost benefits of new storage and understand how storage could better play into the grid. Okay, great. Well, uh, if the, I see a couple more questions that are, that are flying in here. Um, and so I, if, if I think we've got a little bit of extra time. Paul, you ready for a couple more? I can answer a couple more, but let's make sure we've got plenty of time for Josh. Okay. Um, have you guys looked at the cost benefit of thermal versus electric storage? Yeah, we've, we've compared um, CSP thermal storage. Um, we haven't done a whole lot of work with thermal storage in buildings. I think thermal storage in buildings is one of the kind of interesting opportunities for shifting air conditioning demand. Um, so that, could, that I think is going to be really important. Um, most of our work um, has been more on CSP with thermal storage, which can do a lot of load shifting as well. But I, I think really thermal storage um, it needs to do needs to be better understood, especially in the California context, where there's such a huge demand 
in the summer for for electric uh, for air conditioning. Well, well, great, Paul, and, and thanks, everybody. We'll keep these questions coming in, and if we have a little bit extra time after Josh is done, we can open it back up to the rest of the panel. Um, with that, Josh, are you ready to take it away? Yes, thanks. So I think it's a, a nice transition to move from discussions on the duck curve and looking at the maximum uh, amount of renewable penetration we can get and the sacrifices that we're making at that point, and then see what opportunities exist for energy storage. Uh, to come in and help support that. So I'm uh, happy to be here presenting today and uh, about the study to look at really the value for storage. We finished this and published it um, late last year, so it's uh, still pretty fresh for everyone. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so what, what I want to do is just uh, give you a little background on the storage in California, which many of you may be aware of, uh, and then some of the modeling methodologies that we're using and look at the scenarios, um, and then uh, and then a brief look at the results. We really want to kind of whet the appetite, and then we'll we'll provide links afterwards. And of course, we're open to, to questions, and then any follow-up uh, messages. I'm, I'm sure we can respond to those as well. I think of the next slide. So, uh, if you're, if you're aware, in California, there's a storage mandate for um, uh, achieving 1.325 gigawatts worth of storage and the type of storage it isn't specific, but it is specific about um, when those procurements will happen and in which sectors those will happen. So you can see on the figure here, there's the three in investor-owned utilities and there's a sort of a rollout of storage through the years and they're in different sectors if you're transmission sited, distribution sited, or customer more like behind the meter storage. So, so we're following a lot of these assumptions and in, uh, in the model that we're working with. So if you go to the next slide. So to provide a little more background on that, we're also using, um, uh, similar to the LCGSN, uh, the over or the duck curve paper, we're also using this uh, long-term procurement planning uh, information and the ISO has developed this database um, along with support from the PUC, and it, it follows along uh, with this uh, proceeding, the LTPP uh, document. So we're going to use that model. We're looking at 33 and 40 percent uh, renewable generation, and what this uh, model does is a production cost model. So you're going to look at simulating unit commitment, um, energy dispatch, and provision of reserves. It's on the hourly time step. Um, and I won't go through all the details here, but one of the interesting things is uh, that this, uh, in, in this 2014 version of the model, they've um, implemented a, a, a value at which uh, they've essentially placed a value on the curtailed energy. So this creates some kind of interesting things in the model. Uh, moving forward, I'm not sure um, the, maybe the best way to do that, but this is definitely one of the ways. So that's what we're looking at there. Um, and then, in addition to using the uh, production cost model, which is going to get you um, information about kind of the system costs and prices, emissions, and how the resource mixes are changing, uh, we're also using a fixed price optimization model that uses historical prices and allows you to look at kind of the revenues. So, if you can go to the next slide. So, for the scenarios that we're looking at, I uh, really separated them into two categories. We have the base case scenarios, and we'll have the sensitiv some sensitivities. So the base case, as you'd expect, would be uh, kind of a no storage case where we're removing storage from the California system and seeing how uh, it responds, and then one where we're putting storage back in as prescribed by this um, storage mandate, which you see as the base there on the left, and then uh, the, then a third one where we're looking at providing only energy, so not being able to provide ancillary service for some of them. Um, and then the, another one where we're looking at kind of a similar breakdown of for the energy, but then providing all reserves with that instead of energy and reserves. And then a final one that provides reserves only. So this really is a, allows us to kind of isolate where the value is coming from in terms of the services being provided. And then for the sensitivities, um, we've, we, we had thought for a, a long time about which ones 
to include. So we ended up including a fair, a fairly long list of these. And one one focuses on what if you were to provide predominantly regulation with these, uh, with the storage. Uh, what if it's longer duration storage? What if you change that uh, bit, the bid floor, essentially the point at which uh, the value for curtailed renewable energy is placed? Um, and then we have we have also one that kind of goes along with the um, LCGS study where we're looking at this no export limitation. If you re if you relieved the export constraint on this system, uh, then what what does that do? And then also looking at um, different levels of capacity for that system or for the storage rather. So if you go to the next slide, so now I wanted to go through just a few of the, these kind of uh, high level results and. Like I said, hopefully get you interested, and, if there's a, and then if there's interest, we'll provide some of the links at the end, and you can read more. So kind of by uh, adding the storage as compared to not having storage in the system, which includes California and the entire West, um, you, you see a reduction in the production cost. So it's the you know, system-wide operating cost, uh, and it can range from the 78 to 144 million for the different renewable penetrations. and then if, if you then, we know how much storage we installed, so you can equate that to essentially a, a dollar per kilowatt year value as well. And when one of the interesting things we found is that um, actually avoided generator startup costs are a, play a significant part in this production cost reduction. You can see between 30 and 67 percent, and and um, that is something that you're you're currently not going to get repaid for um, in any kind of energy market setting or any of the markets. Right now, so that that was one of the interesting findings. Moving forward, I think we'll need to continue to uh, uh, find a way to address that. So, if you go to the next slide, some 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 more of the base case results for um, if you, if you're looking at the value and you're and you're just providing um, ancillary service, we found that you can achieve 90% of the value for adding storage in, and then um, and then Adding, in addition to being able to provide ancillary service, then you provide energy and ancillary service to optimize, then, um, then you'll increase that 10% more. So um, really the ancillary service, as I think many people recognize, is one of the highest valued um, assets for storage. But then there's issues then with the uh, market depth, because typically ancillary service markets are relatively shallow, and, uh, and as soon as that's saturated, then it impacts the price. Um, so, um, and so when we did the um, this no export, or I'm sorry, so uh, we looked at um, storage uh, and how that impacts the renewable curtailment, and that was under this this uh, no export. So we still maintain the no export assumption, uh, and we saw that there was a, a reduction when the storage was added um, in the curtailment. And actually, I think those numbers might be uh, switched around. I think we had. Uh, a greater curtailment reduction when we're uh, in the 40% case, uh, but we'll fix that in the slides. And then, um, and then we also saw when you're adding storage, and we look at the carbon emissions. It for California, it's going to be able to reduce the in-state emissions, but on the entire system, it has kind of a mixed impact, where it actually might, uh, depending on the, the resource mixture outside of California, if, if you're going to use your storage uh, to charge. And, and increase the amount of generation coming from coal, you could actually have a negative impact on emissions. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. So those were the base case findings. Now I wanted to kind of do the, another high-level look at some of the sensitivity cases that we, we looked at. And the, one of the first ones was incremental uh, storage, both in the capacity and in the duration. So we were in both of those cases to see um, you know, if you had a smaller portfolio, what does the value look like? And we and we found that um, as you add more storage, and not surprisingly, as you add more storage to the system, uh, the incremental value of that you know additional unit of storage is going to be less than the previous one. And and then uh, in in terms of the duration, if now you're to take your storage and you're to increase the um, duration that you can provide it for, so. In the, in the model, we have two, four, and six hours for the storage. If we were to increase that by either one hour or increase it by four hours, we can see 
we see a relatively modest increase in um, the production cost reduction coming from that. So we can go to the next slide. And just a, a few more of the sensitive sensitivity case results. So uh, in terms of the in terms of the regulation, uh, if we're providing you know very specifically just that regulation, as I mentioned, these markets are pretty uh, can be pretty shallow, so it can cause some of these zero price um, issues where you're actually and this is I think as a result of the model more than uh, anything else because it may not happen that way in the actual uh, markets, but uh, a saturation of the regulation market by storage is then signaled by these zero prices in the model, uh, and and we saw those in that case. Um, and then I'll uh, do one more of these points. So when we looked at uh, removing the X limitation on California, what it does is it reduces a lot of the curtailment because you can uh, import and export more freely. Uh, there's uh, greater uh, cooperation between these regions, but in terms of the storage value, it actually relieves some of the flexibility issues that you're seeing in state, um, which overall would reduce the value for storage. So it's one of these kind of um, kind of back and forth issues. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So hopefully, I've provided a, a high-level overview, like I said, and. Uh, a little bit quick, but obviously there's the, the, an entire report. Some uh, nice light reading for you if you're interested in, in reading up on that, and be happy to take questions now. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot, Josh. And, and we've actually got a few questions that are coming in. Um, w one of the first questions we're going to take is about uh, system inertia under these scenarios. Uh, Greg, can you help us understand a little bit more about this? Yeah, sure. So uh, I would reference you to, if you're interested in this question about inertia, to look at the uh, GE report that was done as part of the low carbon grid study. And it is linked to in the, uh, in the study materials. So if you go to the low carbon grid study website or look in this presentation, uh, it's there. Now, they didn't do a full uh, model of these particular scenarios, but we did pull some analysis from the production cost runs to look at the, uh, the penalty of non-synchronous generators and, and things like that in different regions. Now, there's still, because you know, we haven't done a full modeling effort on any of these scenarios, there's still some questions, and really there's questions worldwide about you know, how, how much of your generation can be synchronous versus non-synchronous in a specific region, particularly, you know, can you have a small region in Southern California that has very little um, synchronous generation when it's part of a huge grid that has a lot of synchronous generation? Uh, it's questions that we haven't really answered yet, uh, and uh, but, but we're we're doing some work, and and you know, initial results have not shown a big problem, um, but but we're really we really need to do more work to get um, you know a more precise answer to that question. And so, GE and others are uh, moving forward with this type of work. Great. Um, uh, well, here's a question I got for Josh. Uh, Josh, can you can you comment a little bit about how increased renewable development in the rest of the West, like Arizona or other states, might affect the ability to export surplus energy? Right. Yeah. The, the idea of being a good neighbor. So so right now, if the uh, if California has a very high mandate and they're headed towards you know 40 percent renewables and and the rest of the West isn't or is a much, on a much slower trajectory, then you can sort of rely on some of the flexibility from their generation. And uh, but then as they start to add renewables, then, then I think you're you're not able to sort of uh, offload that that problem. Which, as I mentioned before, when we're, when we're looking at releasing that export constraint, now all of a sudden um, you're able to more freely interact with the rest of of your region. So California was then able to um, reduce their curtailment, uh, you know, just by that increased level of flexibility. But uh, if if other regions are starting to add renewables, then I then I think um, storage would then uh, play an option as well. So if if uh, every region in the West has you know similar renewable uh, portfolio, it's as if um, you know California didn't allow the exports because no one's going to be able to export. We're all getting solar generation at roughly the same time. You may get some uh, regional aggregation for wind. Uh, but that, that may be to less extent. So I, I can see that increasing the value of storage as other parts of the West add renewables. Hey, thanks a lot, Josh.
Well, that just about wraps it up for us today. Uh, we're looking forward to having a, a lot more uh, communications like this in the future, so please stay tuned uh, to your email for further distributions from myself or the rest of us at the NRL team to talk about future projects. And one project that we're going to talk about in the next couple, uh, couple weeks is the Eastern Renewable Generation Integration Study. In the meantime, if you guys have follow-up questions, please write the authors, write me, aaron.bloom at nrel.gov, and uh, we'd love to hear more from you. So thanks a lot for participating today, and we'll see you next time.